The ex-prime ministers, what do you do with them? Well, it's not a new question, is it? Margaret Thatcher, she had Ted Heath back in the day. John Major, he had Margaret Thatcher. David Cameron, well, he pretty much disappeared after losing the Brexit referendum. So he didn't sit behind Theresa May breathing down her neck, but she was occasionally a critic of Boris Johnson. But none of those ex-prime ministers really posed a threat, let alone a, a challenge to their predecessor. Now, though, yeah. Rishi Sunak has two of them, watching, waiting, keeping up his profile in Johnson's case and smarting and licking her wounds, nursing a sense of the unfairness of <laughs> life and politics in the case of Liz Truss. What are they up to? Lucy Fisher, let's start with Liz Truss, shall we? There's some movement going on online. A new WhatsApp group? Well, actually, John, not a new WhatsApp group, but uh, a reprisal of uh, a former WhatsApp group um, used by Liz Truss's supporters to bolster her leadership campaign. Now, this is the Conservative Growth Group. That's what they call themselves. They are essentially a ginger group who, uh, the understanding is, are going to try and, in ahead of the budget in March, um, make the argument that Liz Truss herself was trying to make, that there is a need for tax cuts, for supply-side uh, reforms to try and galvanise growth in the economy. So we haven't heard much from Liz Truss in the past 100 days. She's said to have taken a breather. But it's in keeping with what we know of her. She's, uh, she's a defiant politician. She is unapologetic. And those who thought she was going to slink off for good have another thing coming. It still seems to feel, doesn't she, Lucy, that she was hard done by. Uh, that given a chance yeah. and a fair wind, her, her idea, her driving, defining idea, could have just pulled it off. As I read someone put it really well the other the other moment. It was a bin fire, but she was convinced a phoenix might fly out of it. Oh, that's a great way of putting it. Yeah, I think the, the narrative that both she and Kwasi Kwarteng have settled on is that they try to do too much too fast. It was the speed and the boldness of their ambitions that got the better of them. But yeah. um, no, I, you know, she is planning to make an intervention before the budget. And there's even talk of perhaps an inquest piece of her reflecting a bit more publicly on exactly what went wrong. What do you think, Chris? Should, should, should Rishi Senate be worried about Liz Truss? I don't think so. I think that she recognises that the, her moment came and went with that disastrous sure. yeah, yeah. Um, autumn statement, didn't it? When 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 she 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 managed to um, disconnect tax policy from forecasting and that spooked the market. She does feel, I think, and I know she feels that the blob got her. Um, which you're still, you're still the idea of productivity and growth is still right. And I think that's where we'll see it come back. But that really isn't too far away from what Jeremy Hunt's saying. Mm. There might be, it's more, the point of the debate really in the party is how fast to get there. And she may, if she starts calling for tax cuts ahead of the March budget, that'll put some unwelcome pressure on Jeremy Hunt. Yeah. Uh, I think that that's where it's going. And there may be, there may be a fair amount of that pressure. I, I should be clear, I don't for a moment imagine that Rishi Sunak needs to fear for, him, for his job against, against Liz Truss. But the Trussonomics camp, that is still still there. And it seems to have gained, uh, Chris, doesn't it, a, a bit of strength since the fall of, of Liz Truss. I mean, there was no way uh, Kwasi Kwarteng's disastrous budget was going to kill off the argument for, for lower tax no. and supply-side reform as a way of stimulating the economy. That, that's a core tenet of Conservative thinking. But it's, it's regaining, well, it, 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 regaining some of its muscle now. That's right. It's the core tenet of, of right-wing Conservative thinking. And, and the risk was for, for the right that Liz Truss had buried that kind of orthodoxy for a generation, and they won't allow that to happen. And that's all there is. And that's why when Boris Johnson talks about tax cuts um, at the Carlton Club a fortnight ago, it's a front page story in the Telegraph, because I think a lot of our readers over here and and uh, p maybe party supporters want to hear more about cutting taxes, but there's nothing from Rishi Sunak on that. I expect probably an indication of future tax cuts, tax cuts deferred, if you like, in next month's budget, mm. planned, I mean, maybe even the 19p, the 20p to 19p, income tax base rate cut that Richard Sinek looked at last March when he was Chancellor, don't forget, and he planned that for um, April 24, that yeah. kind of thing, yeah. to give some hope to get through this year. But will that be enough, I think, to fight a, a, a midterm election on? I don't think so. Yeah, let, let, let's talk about Boris Johnson, uh, Chris, because you are a student of Boris Johnson. If there was such a <laughs> thing, if there was such a thing, you would be a professor of Boris Johnson. So, <laughs> so what is Boris Johnson playing at? Well, he's keeping the home fires burning, isn't he? I mean, he's not overtly encouraging talk of of uh, running uh, again or taking on Liz, uh, Liz, Liz Sunak, but he certainly is keeping it going. He likes to be talked about. If he's not being talked about, he's not being successful. And that's why you're seeing these people like Stephen Greenhalgh come out and say, where is he? There's a feeling of a lack of legitimacy that Rishi Sunak has got because he wasn't actually voted in by any members. He was imposed by 
by MPs on their party. He didn't win the, the election last summer. That was Liz Truss, of course. And their favourite was, was Sat. They are bruised. And many of them will want Boris Johnson back. And for now, he's like Lilliput. He's, um, sorry, Gulliver's Travels. He, but with the Lilliputians binding him down with this inquiry over privileges, whether he <laughs> lied to the House of Commons over, over party gate. But if he couldn't cut himself free, he might spring forward. Um, that's maybe the, the hope of his supporters. Yeah. Um, but lots of MPs where I'm in the House of Commons at the moment speaking to you, they don't want him back. They, 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 got, they saw what it was like when he was there, the chaos. And they'd rather have the boredom of Rishi Sunak, Rishi Sunak to the chaos of Johnson. Yeah, it's almost. I, I, I may just be imagining it, Chris, but it's as if your eyes are shining when you look at talk about the, the prospect of <laughs> Boris Johnson re-emerging <laughs> well, in a flash of light on the stage. Well, it, it cheers everyone up. I was at a party on Monday for Anthony Brown, who's a former colleague of yours at the Times, Lucy, and now he's an MP. And he told a story about all the people he'd worked with. And the one that got the laugh and was most fun was a Boris Johnson story. He does mm. cheer this place up and it does feel a bit dreary in, in January. I think, and that's what people miss, maybe. Maybe not the country, but certainly maybe in journalism, we miss someone like Boris Johnson and the colourful uh, nature that he has. Yeah, I mean, he's been Lucy Boris Johnson in, in the States mm -hmm. in recent days, hasn't he? Meeting all sorts of big hitters on the on the Republican side. He met Kevin McCarthy, yeah. the Republican leader in the House of Representatives. He's been uh, well, banging the drum as a, as a champion of, of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And in the course of that, by the way, he said, Let, let's send Ukraine more and more advanced weapons, including jets, which yeah. was, I think he said that within hours yeah. of Rishi Sunak saying, we're not going to send them jets, which sounded to me like, I don't know, a straw in the wind or something. Definitely. I think there's two, two important points there. One is that um, anyone in the UK who thinks, well, Boris Johnson's been a bit quiet uh, of late. Um, he hasn't. He's been busy, but it has been overseas. As you say, he's been in Washington meeting um, senators. He's been making TV appearances. He made a speech to the Atlantic Council. He wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post. He's also, of course, been in Ukraine. So he's very much still... Um, thinking about things politically, he's been out and about, just not on domestic turf. And you're right, I think there are um, big dangers for Rishi Sunak on two fronts from Boris Johnson. The first is Ukraine and him trying to make the weather and um, bounce Rishi Sunak into action, like you say, calling um, for uh, the West to supply jets to Kyiv, which is something that both London and Washington don't want to do. He's also made clear he thinks that NATO should allow Ukraine to join, which would be a huge move, potentially dragging the alliance into yeah. World War Three. I don't think there's any sign of that. In fairness, I think he said after the war, uh, they, after they could the join war, but NATO, but he was pushing know, it. Yeah, he was he was pushing it. And on and the second area, where I think he presents a real problem for Rishi Sunak is on Brexit. We know that Sunak now is trying to um, line up a deal um, with the EU on the protocol. It sounds like all the technical aspects to that have been um, uh, organised. But as Chris mentioned mm. earlier the really key um, political stumbling block on what kind of role there would be for the European Court of Justice, yes. even if it's a fudge, even if it um, would be the case that it would have to be the Northern Irish courts themselves that would have to refer cases yes. to the ECJ. That ain't going to be an easy fight with the ERG, the hardline Brexiteers of the European Research yeah. Group, or the D Democratic Unionist Party. And I can just imagine Boris Johnson licking his lips at the opportunity for him to make clear his displeasure about that's that. A, that's a, a big and, and rapidly approaching quest, question, uh, Chris, isn't it? Because at the top of this programme, you you made the point that maybe those, the peacemakers, let's call, it, call them that for the one of anything else, they, who want to do a deal with... Uh, with with the European Union on the protocol on the remaining bit of the Brexit jigsaw, they may find it tougher than they imagine from uh, conservative Brexiteers, from the Democratic Unionists. And what about Chris? What about Boris Johnson? Is he going to jump into that argument with both feet? That could be a big worry for Rishi Sunak. I, I bet it is. I bet he will. He's tempted to get in there. He's always seen Brexit as a sovereignty issue, I think, and that's why he might well step in. And I think that would be really would worry. Rishi Sunak, and we're facing net on Tuesday the House of Lords debate, the second reading of the re retained EU law bill that's axing thousands of redundant European Union rules. That's the first big contest with the Lords. The Northern Ireland Protocol bill is paused. If that comes back into the House of Lords as a second big battle, I think Johnson knows that he's the first line of his obituary, probably, is leading 
the Brexit vote as he did. And he was the, the difference, many think, his personality was the difference between winning and losing in that debate. And so he is almost personally wrapped up in that. And he said, didn't he, famously, that they'll sort out this Northern Ireland Protocol issue mm. after the event. Well, that's his unfinished business. But I was there on Tuesday at this event, extraordinary event, the European Movement, when I heard um, uh, David Jones, the vice chair of the ERG, saying that, that they might even look to abolish the House of Lords if they oppose any action on, on Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. The, the feeling amongst Brexiteers is it is an unfinished business. You yes. might think Brexit's done. No one's saying rejoin it in, in frontline, rejoin the EU in frontline politics. But guess what? Brexit is nowhere near done for lots of people here. Right. Here, look, here's a question for both of you then. On that question, if it comes to it, if the battle lines are drawn, let us say Boris Johnson is on the opposite side to Rishi Sunak, and it's a real test of strength, dare, dare Rishi Sunak defy them? I mean, as, as with Theresa May, there was a strong body of really potentially uh, troublemaking Brexiteers who made her life a misery, and ultimately we saw what happened. The rest is, is history. They weren't the majority of, the, of Conservative MPs, though. Now, in this case, are the Brexiteers, those who will not buy a deal with Europe, are they the majority? Could Rishi Sunak face them down in a nutshell, Lucy? For me, it's not the ERG. I think he could potentially run roughshod over them. It's the DUP. He's got to meet their seven tests. There's no point doing a deal that won't lead to... Uh, the the resumption of storm on the executive in Northern yeah. Ireland. Otherwise, you're going to have to renegotiate it again further down the but line. But you think he could deal with the Brexiteers on his I own think side? He could. What about you, Chris? Could could Rishi Sunak face them down on his own side? No, he couldn't. So I think the part of the problem is that actually the working majority of the government isn't 80. It's more like 20. Okay. Anything above 20, they, the Sunak and his team seem to fold under pressure. That's why I think he hasn't got the votes. There's no way okay. he can accept the offer from oh, the right. That's your verdict, and that's Lucy's. We will see how it plays out.